Amen. Yeah, thank you so much. We are going to be blessed as Brother Raghu give us the second dose yeah. of the medicine from this morning. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. And let us pray. Almighty Father, we are so thankful that we can come into your presence, sit at your feet, so that you can teach us your way into the kingdom of God. Give us understanding, lead us from misunderstanding into all your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me introduce my message. What I'm going to talk about is the faith of Jesus. Yes. Okay. That's my general subject. But there are four foundations of truth. The Bible says in John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he's going to guide you into how many truth? All the truth. So we must be established in all the truth in order to be saved. So the first foundation is found in John 14 and verse 6. What Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth. So who is truth? Jesus. Second foundation is found in John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. What is truth? Word is truth. And I want you to understand that when they say the word is truth, Revelation 19, Revelation 19, not Revelation 19, Revelation 19, 13, says he is dressed in a vesture deep in blood, and his name shall be called the word. So Jesus is called the word. That is called the logos. Logos in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, logos. It means an expression of a thought or the express thought of the Father. Okay, so he's the logos. And then the third foundation of truth is found in Psalms 1, 1, 19, verse 142. He says, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And the what? The law is the truth. Did you hear that? Yes. And then the fourth foundation is found in Psalms 119, verses 151. It says, All thy commandments are truth. Are you checking it out? So Jesus is truth. His word is truth, his law is truth, and the commandment is truth. So when the Lord say, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is going to guide you into how many truth? That is the all truth. So you cannot be saved by just accepting Jesus. Because what is Jesus Christ is the very embodiment of truth. Eh? The word was made flesh and dwell among us. The law is his character. So when we're talking about Jesus, we are talking about all that. So you can't say you're trampling upon the law and say you're accepting Jesus. Right. He will never dwell in you. His presence will not dwell in you. That is what exactly what he says in John. John chapter 14 and verse 23. 23. Can somebody read that? John 14, 23. 23. This is just a, a built up with what I want to teach you. If something I missed out this morning, very important, I will do that before I move on. Somebody have a loud voice, you can... Yeah. You see, if you love the Lord and keep his words, he promised he and his father will come and make the abode in you. So it's not only Jesus coming and living in you, but the father himself coming and living in you too. 
Okay. Something this morning I, I, I missed to teach you, and I want to do that now. This board is moving. Uh, yeah. Okay. The word for man is ish. And the word for woman is Isha. That is Hebrew. So the word for man is Ish. That is a leaf, yard, and shin. And the word for woman is a leaf, shin, and he. When God created a man, he put his presence into the man. Because the word for God is Yod, He, Vav, He. That's the name of God, Yod, He, Vav, He. It really means the hand of grace hook you to grace. Yes, so it really, Yod, He, Vav, He. We say Yahweh. Yahweh in the Hebrew. So it's a hand of grace hook you to grace. And this is exactly what a leaf is. A leaf is two yod and a vav. So, so this is a vav, a yod, and a yod. So the hand of God stretched forth to the earth and hook man from the earth and lift him up. And the, 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 the word for, for yod is, is humility. So a humble hand stretching down to get a humble hand and lifting them up. So if you're not humble, you will not be exalted. Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. To be exalted, it must be. Okay, so watch me something now. Let me show you something a little more powerful here. If you take the yod and the hay, that is equal to Yah. That's the name of God. Yahweh. That's, that's the name of God. And what you end up with is, is a leaf. You end up with a leaf and shin. A leaf and shin is equal to ish, E-S-H. Notice man named ish, I-S-H. This is equal to ish. That is equal to eternal fire. Remember what the Bible says in Genesis 6.3? The Spirit of God will not always strive with men. When husbands and wives, I'm using husband and wife together, and they depart from God, stop serving God, this is lost, and this is lost. And you end up with Alif and Ish, that is equal to eternal fire. It will burn up your relationship because the presence of God is no longer in your relationship. Yeah, that's how serious it is. Yod he, that's God's name. God take the hand, Yod is hand, strength, and he give it to the man. Yeah, strength, and he give it to the man. He take the he, the grace, and he give it to the woman. That's his name, that's his name, Yod he, vav he. That's Hebrew. So if you depart from God, serving God, and you depart from God, the Spirit of God will depart, and you end up with ish. And that fire will burn up your relationship until you come back to God. We, we play with that. This is serious business. It, it's very serious. So husbands and wives, you've got to keep that relationship, keep that worship, Keep that morning and evening sacrifice burning. Otherwise, if you lose your yard and you use the hay, the desire for righteousness is no longer there. And if that is no longer there, then God will depart. The Spirit of God will depart. And you're left to your own. All your decision is going to be messed up.
Yeah, ask your question so that you can get clarity. Yes, I know you're saying husband and wife, husband and wife. They're single parent family. They're single person and all of that. So how do you... Um, yes, it's applicable to the same thing. So if I put a, if I put a man-ish, right? The yard here. If he depart from God, if he's single and he depart from God, this will be, the presence of God will depart. I like to bring it into family, family life. Now, this will depart. The presence of God will not be. And every decision he makes is going to be a bad decision. Because the Spirit of God will not be there to direct him in making decisions and making purchases and whatever. What she was also asking is, those who are single parents, how do you fit in at that part of, of the gravity? Yeah, well, e even though it is a single parent, man or woman, Ish or Isha, if they live in the life right? If they're living a life to suit God, they will be blessed. The blessing will remain. Yes, it's just departing from God. Once you depart from God and not worshiping God at all. Oh, uh, uh, um, as I talk about that, the million dollar question this morning I did not answer. How can I, how can I live in the presence of God? And I'm glad this come back. How can I live in the presence of God? So you've got to take your, your Bible and read. <laughs> read. So Psalms 100 and verse 2. So I want somebody to be reading. Take the mic along and see how we can live in the presence of God. Somebody reading? Okay, read. Get the mic. Eddie, the mic. Yeah. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. You see? So there must be singing. That's how you come into the presence of God. There must be family worship. There must be singing. Singing is like a, is like an invocation, invoking the presence of God into the family. Come into the present with singing. So that's why sometimes when you come to church and you miss the song service, you're just sluggish. You, you miss a lot. It usher you into the presence of God. Elder, I want to ask a question here. Let's just say me and my family, or me and some, sorry, me and my family, or mm. me and some friends come here to worship. Mm -hmm. And some of <clears> us is <throat> taking part in the song service. And some us of us decide, well, I'm going to be entertained with the night singing. Mm -hmm. Are we having the same experience? Are we experiencing the presence of God? Well, well from today you will know that singing usher you into the presence of God. So you're not coming to be entertained. You are participant in the whole process. Amen. Okay, and not spectators. Right. So you have to participate and sing. Everybody has to sing. It's good for your soul. Okay, so that one thing is singing. Psalms 95 and verse 2. 95 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. 95 2 says, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving okay. and make a joyful noise with psalms. Okay, Unto so you, him you're psalms. coming before the Lord in thanksgiving. So when you come here, you need to give to God thanks for lots of things your family, your life spared, how we deliver you what you were able to achieve, accomplish. And not only that, sometimes you have to, you know, buy some things and give to the poor, feed the poor, whatever. Thanksgiving in several different ways. Not just saying, Lord, I thank you. Because gratitude is much more than a verbal expression of just saying thanks. Okay? So you need to extend to those who haven't got. That's Thanksgiving. I think read, read verse 6, rather, than 5. Verse read six. 6. Okay, verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Mm. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. So you come in before his presence with what? Worship. Worship. Real worship. Bowing before him, recognizing his sovereignty, his greatness, and worship God. The Bible says in John chapter 4 and 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship God must worship God in what? Spirit, spirit and, and truth. in truth. The Greeks say, that is to say, in sincerity. So you've got to worship God, sincerely worship God. Mm -hmm. Okay? James, 
James chapter 4 and verse 8. Read. Okay, one second. 4 8. James 4 8. Okay, I get it. James 4 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So if you are not drawing nigh unto God, he will not draw nigh unto you. Mm -hmm. Draw nigh. And the rest of the text, you want the rest of the text? It says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Okay, so you need to draw an eye unto God. Where there ever there is service, make sure you be there. Because God has something for you. In time Not only too. on the Sabbath, be on prayer meeting. Any service the church has is for your benefit. The, the leaders structure it so that you can benefit from it. Don't stay away. You're going to lose the blessing. And the time that you need those messages, you would not have it. John 15, 5. What does it say? John 15, 5. 15, 5. One sec. Okay. If you abide. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, mm -hmm. ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can't do nothing. Yes, eh? You could abide. The word abide in the Greek means meno. It means to stay with, to hang on with, to, to lime with, common word, to fellowship with. Meno. He that meno with me, he that stay with me, he that hang out with me. The same bring it much fruits, for without me, you can do nothing. Just remember that part. Without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 7, what does it say? 15, 7 says, If you abide with if me, If you abide in me, and, and my, my words abide in you, mm. you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You see, it's a, a you. promise attached to it. In other words, you've got to study the word of God. You, the word of God must abide in you. And the word of God is alive. Don't play with the word of God. John 6 and verse 63 say the word I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Mm -hmm. Don't change the word, don't alter it to suit your, your fancy. It's spirit and it's alive. Elder, just one. You know, my wife was telling me, you know, we do devotional, right? When we have in our family mm -hmm. worship, we use a devotional. It have a text mm -hmm. and we, it have the commentary, maybe the spirit of prophecy. But she was tell, she were talking last night and she says, you know something? We have to start to use our Bible. All right? Mm -hmm. And um, we decide from tomorrow, mm -hmm. we're going to start reading from the New Testament from <coughs> the beginning. Yeah. Straight Bible. Yeah, the word. The, the, the word has to abide in you. And when the word abide in you, it's really Jesus Christ who is abiding in you. I am Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live by the word, the grace of the Son of God who died for me. So is Christ coming in you, the hope of glory. Matthew 28 and verse 20, read. Matthew 28 mm -hmm. and verse what? 20. Well, nine, 19, you could go from 19. The command is in 19. 19 right? mm. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The antithesis of the text or the opposite of the text. If you go, I will be with you. If you don't go, I will not be with you. When you go, the Spirit of the Lord go with you. If you don't, he's not there. So if you want the Spirit of God to be with you continuously, witnessing is the avenue whereby you, you could accomplish that. And the presence of God will be with you. Don't, don't be afraid of their faces. The Spirit of God will be with you. Yeah. In the youth Sabbath school, and the question is, how do I hear God calling me? How do you hear He's how calling? How do you recognize God's call? Okay. 
My sheep know my voice, and when they hear my voice, they will follow me. The voice of God is the word of God. God speaks through his word. God lives in you through his word. The spirit of God dwells in you through his word. Okay, so the word of God is the voice of God. In other words, when, when people understand Bible truth, they will follow the voice. Is, is the word of God. Okay? And, but you see, truth is progressive. Even though I put the four foundation here, if people are very gen genuous and accept Jesus Christ, he will guide them into all the truth. You will know, he will, he will teach you his requirement, and you will follow him. But the first thing is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. That's why I said this morning, the, the, the gospel has two parts. The person of Jesus and the principle of Jesus. A lot of people f say, well, I accept Jesus and not the principle. I think it's there where the Jews made that mistake. And modern Christendom is making the same mistake. The Jews accept the law, very circumspect to the law, but rejected Jesus. Modern Christendom today accept Jesus and they reject the law. The same monkey pants. You cannot, you cannot separate it. Okay? So the law of Jesus creates your peace and the, and, the, and the principle of Jesus creates your prosperity. You see? So, so to be prosperous, God wants us to be prosperous. He says we shall be the head and not the tail. We shall lend and not borrow. But sometimes we look like we're dragging along like the tail. Because we're not applying the principle. It's the principle of God gives us prosperity. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Okay. Uh, so I give you understand what I'm saying. I'll just give you a few here. So let me go to the, what I want to teach you here this evening, the fate of Jesus. It's in found in, in um, Revelation 14 and verse 12. Read. And that's a, third, that's a third angel message. Revelation 14, 12. Okay. And it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The prophet says that the church is emphasizing one to the neglect of the other. The church emphasizes the commandment to the neglect of the faith of Jesus. And most, and most of the church members do not understand what the faith of Jesus is. You see, there are two different types of righteousness. Two different types of righteousness the Bible mentioned. There was one in Romans 8 and verse 4. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, by Romans 3, 21 and 22. Read. There's another righteousness. Okay. So it says, 3, 21 and 22, it says, right? Yeah. But now the righteousness of, the, of God without the law. Without the law. Is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You, you know, okay, he, stop, stop, stop right there. Okay. You notice something? The righteousness of God without the law, mm -hmm. but it is witnessed by the war. Law the and Lord. The so if you say, if you say you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you do not have to keep the law, well, you're in trouble because the law and the prophets stand as weakness against you. Read, read, read verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them, that believe. Yeah, let me, for let me, there is no difference. Different. Let me show you the mistake that other de denominations make. Go to Romans 10 and verse 3 and 4. Romans 10, verse 3 and verse 4. 10, 3 and 4 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness mm -hmm. and going about to establish their own righteousness having not submitted themselves to the righteousness, unto the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. You hear verse 4? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. 
In other words, as far as righteousness is concerned that will save you, the righteousness of the law cannot save you. You can only be saved by the righteousness of Christ, which is by the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the righteousness of God. The prophet says we understand the commandment, but the church does not understand the faith of Jesus. So let's see what the Bible says. So I want you to read with me. Read over... um, um, let, me, let, me, let me see this. Okay. Read Revelation 14 and verse 12. Galatians um, 2 and verse 16. Um, read. Keep reading. As Galatians 3, 22. Um, Philippians um, 3 and verse 9. Revelation. Romans. Revelation uh, 14, 12 says, as we read before, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Of Jesus, right. So let's understand what the faith of Jesus is all about. So Galatians 2, 16 get, makes a distinction between faith in Jesus and faith of Jesus. Now let me show you something. F- having faith in Jesus alone will not save you. The robe that is woven in the loom of heaven has it in it not one thread of human devising. There's nothing that you can do could cause you to, to get salvation. She said, even though the sinner cannot save himself, there is still something he has to do to secure his salvation, not to own it. Okay, so it makes a distinction here. Read Galatians 2 and 16 and look for faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. Read. So it says here, know that knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ is a faith in Jesus. That we might be justified by the the faith of Christ. Right. You must, yeah, go ahead. And not by the works of the law, Mm -hmm. for by grace, sorry, for the works Mm -hmm. of the law shall not, sorry, by the works of the law Mm -hmm. shall no flesh be justified. Yeah. Okay, let's come back here. Go and read now Galatians 3.22. That brought it out very clear. You understand the distinction. 3.22. And, and before, before you go, do you know the new translation is changing the faith of Jesus into the faith in Jesus? The change in that. So I'll go read something for you just now. Okay, it so says 3.22. Right? 3.22. And it says, But the scripture had concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of jesus of might be jesus given. christ might be given to them that believe. that believe so the faith of jesus is a gift from god did you hear that mm-hmm. the faith of jesus is a promise that he has promised us and he gave it unto us it's a gift from god you can't work for that mm-hmm. Revelation 10, 19. Revelation 10, 19. Yeah. Read, read Revelation 10, 19, she said. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It doesn't have 19 and 10. You want to get Maybe 19, 19, 10. And I, 1910, right? And it says here, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou doest not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus. Spirit of prophecy. prophecy. Okay, so we see here it's a gift. You can't work for it. The faith of Jesus is a gift. It is something that Jesus worked out. I think it's in the book, The Faith I Live By. Um, page 113. Let me get this for you. Uh, by, by the time, read, read Roman, Philippians 3.9. Yeah. Okay, I got it. 
Read Philippians 3 9. While he's looking for that, let me read this here. Nine. Yeah. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which above which is above every name. No, Philippians 3 9. What? Philippians 3 9. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I made a mirror. I read 2 9 instead. Okay, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Of the law. But you see? that which is true, the faith of Jesus, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see? You, not the righteousness of the law. That can't save you. That was what I saying in Romans 10, 4. But you are saved by the righteousness of the faith of Jesus. Hear what the spirit of prophecy says in the book Upward Look. Um, only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. The covering is a robe of his own righteousness. Christ will put on every repentant, believing soul. I counsel to, thee by, to buy of me gold and tried in the fire, that thou may be rich. But here what she concluded here. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandment. Did you hear that? By his perfect righteousness, perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to keep obey God's commandment. So this is what he did. By his perfect obedience, the life he lives, he now credited that on our behalf. So when you go to God and ask God for forgiveness, he forgives you, he cleanses you. And his imputed righteousness is now credited on your behalf. That is the faith of Jesus. That is the, the, what he carved out for in the life that he lived. His life is now credited on, on my life when I accept and believe by faith. Justification by faith. Okay. Look at this, the, the distinction here. He, he, he would tend to read the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have no pleasure in him. Faith come by what? Hearing and hearing the word of God. I wanted to read Luke 8 and 18 and verse 8. And verse 8. What is faith? Anybody could say what is faith? Give me a definition for faith. Trust. I could take that. Anybody else? Huh? Believe. Believe something is going to happen. Anybody else again? Yeah, give me that mic. Yeah, faith is believing that God could do what he declared in his words. Okay. I like that. Faith is believing the word of God and expecting the word of God to do what it says. Amen. When the centurion came to Jesus, he said, Master, my servant is grievously tormented with a palsy. What Jesus said, Christ said, I will come and heal him. What did, what did the centurion say? Master, no, I'm not worried that thou shouldest come and honor my roof. But Master, just speak the word and my servant shall be healed. Jesus said, I, haven't, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. What did the centurion expect to heal his servant? The word. the word. So what is faith? Faith is believing the word of God and expecting the word of God to do what it says. It says where two and three are gathered, he is in the midst. He is here. That's why when we come to church, we got to be in reverence. Don't talk while the preacher is talking. Don't read something while he is talking. Pay attention. Anything other than that is irreverence. I didn't plan to give Yeah. By having a relationship with the Lord, you begin to know him. Yeah. Want to spend time with him. Yeah. Therefore, you trust him. Yeah. I mean, let's look at it. How many of us get on an airplane? Right. You never meet the pilot, but you trust you're going you to get to Texas, to New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you get on a big boat. Mm -hmm. In Guyana, yeah. they have a big boat and these speedboats. Yeah. 
Now, I didn't, I hesitated on the speedboat, and I never saw the guy standing up and back. <laughs> I never met him, <clears throat> but I got to the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to trust in Jesus. Yeah, you've got to trust, yeah. And his righteous, we can't put his righteousness on us. Right. And he'll provide. He credited on our behalf. provision for yeah. heaven. Yeah. Amen. Very well. Well, t well taken. Okay. Amen. So saving faith is a relationship with God. Amen. Okay. So this is as far as we, we understand that. But what I want to solidify your mind is, is because you see this commandment. You know what the prophet says? Ministers will stand in the pulpit and in open air and tell you to keep Sunday holy. In this church? In this church? Ministers in this church will stand on the pulpit in the latter time and tell you to keep Sunday holy. Yeah. Okay? So I want to solidify you in this commandment, okay, is the character of God. Because John said in, in, in Revelation 14 and verse 1, Lo, I look, and a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on his forehead. His name is his character. The character is his law. Watch this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let me go to verse 4. You see, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord with all our hearts and all our mind and all our souls, and these things I have commanded you shall be in your hearts all the days of your life, and you shall teach your children diligently while you walk it, while you stand it, while you sit it, while you rise it. You shall bind them upon your hand. They shall be frontlit between your eyes. That's the Ten Commandments, the, the seat of intelligence. The memory center, the intuition center, the decision center, the judgment center. There it is written on your forehead. Bind them upon your gates, the going out and the coming in, upon the post, the foundation of the house. Because this is the foundation, the commandment is the foundation. And what Psalm 11 verse 3 says, If the foundation be destroyed, wherein shall the righteous stand? So let me, let me go over this way and solidify it in you. This will never change. So let me look at it in this slide first. Let me bring it in like a story form for you. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 17, God gave the command. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, God did what he wrote it with his own finger. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12 and verse 13, he spoke it in the presence of God, the children of Israel. In Psalms 89, verse 34, he said, I will not alter the things that gone out of my mouth. I will not change it. Huh? He will not change it. He said in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 16, he put it in the holies of the holy, under the mercy seat. If you want to change, move that, you have to move God. He sits in the seat. You can't change it. I'm solidifying your mind that this thing cannot change. In Exodus 15 and verse 26, he said, If you keep my commandment, I will bring none of the diseases upon you that I have brought upon the Egyptians. You will get no cure of it. <laughs> Okay? None of these things I will bring upon you. He read, wrote it on stone in Jeremiah 31 and verse 31 to 34. He moved it from the stone and he put it on your heart. Nobody have to tell you. There was something in your heart, they call it conscience. It is a moral judiciary of the soul. Once you do something wrong, you know that. Nobody has to tell you that. That's the police within your, within your heart. That tells you you are wrong. Okay? In first John, first John two and verse first John yeah, two and verse seven say, I have given you no new commandment, the same commandment from the old. So he hasn't changed it. It's the same thing he has. Never change it. Okay? 
In Psalms 40 and verse 8, Jesus Christ said, I delight to do thy law, for where it is written, in my heart. Psalms 19 and verse 7 and verse 8 say, the law of the law is perfect. What again? The commandment of the law is, is sure. It's perfect. Would you take your child, a perfect child, to the doctor and say, Doctor, I want you to cut off my child's nose. Would you do that? Why are you altering God's commandment? Can't change it. Let me show you something a little more further than that. <clears throat> In 1 King chapter 3 and verse 14, I want you to read. Read. 1 King 3, 14. Uh -huh. Read. 3.14, yeah. Read. And tell me if, you, if, you, if, you, if that need to be done away with. First King 3.14, what does it say? It says, If you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will where's that? lengthen thy days. So if you want to have long life, and God to lengthen your days, you keep the commandments. If you want to have short days and miserable life, you, you don't, don't keep it. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 40. Oh, keep, keep, you know, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 40. Yeah. Four, four, zero. Yeah. All right. It Read. says, Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, as it may go well, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Long days, Forever. and it go well with thee. Remember Exodus 20 and verse 12. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Compare with Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. For thy day shall be long in the land of the living, and it shall be well with thee. The antithesis of the text, or the opposite of the text, is that if you do not obey your parents, you're going to have short days and miserable life. You hear that? You want to have long days and prosperous life? Obey your parents. Okay. Read Deuteronomy 2 and verse 6. He shall buy meat of them for money. No, that Deuteronomy 8. Two. Eight two. He says two. Right. Eight two. Right. Okay. Eight two says, and thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments. Oh, no. Why did God pass the children of Israel into the wilderness? To prove them, to see whether they will keep the commandments. Not only to escape the Canaanites and the giants and them, but this is the primary objective here, to see if they will keep the commandments. He brought them out of Egyptian bondage. In fact, according to Nehemiah 13 and verse 17, it was a violation of the Sabbath that put them into Babylonian captivity. Now he brought them out now into the wilderness to see if they will keep the commandment, and that's why he passed them there. A journey that will take maybe about how many, four days? Took them how many, how many years? Forty years? Yes. My, our God is a covenant-keeping God. Read um, 7 and verse 2. Yeah. It says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them, before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, that thou makest no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Seven, nine. 
7 and 9. Verse 7, the Lord... Verse 9, chapter 7, verse 9. Verse 7 and 9. Okay, good, good. Know therefore that the Lord thy God is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercies with them that love him. For how many generations? Commandments for a thousand generations. A, a thousand generations. Do you know how much a generation is in the Bible? 40 years. Our God keep covenant for a thousand years. 40,000 years. Check it and see how many generations, 40 years, how long this earth is in existence. God don't play with that. Okay? Let me show you this too. Proverbs 7, 1 and 2. Seven. One and two. Read. Somebody else. Can somebody else read too? While he's finding. Read. Feel free to read. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Somebody else? No, we want more than one person reading. Proverbs 7, verse. Anybody could read. 7, 1 and 2, right? Yeah. Or it says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. Oh, stop right there. You hear that? Keep, keep my, my commandments, commandments and, live. and live. Don't keep it and die. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them. Keep verse 2. Verse 2, that's it. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Go down. Go down. Bind them, thy voice tree. Bind them upon thy fingers. Watch this. Bind them upon your what? Fingers. How many fingers you got? Ten. Not nine. Ten, Ten right? Okay. Each one, each one. Right. Write them upon the tables of thine heart. Okay. Bind them upon your finger. Watch it. Watch it. Upon your finger. Ten fingers. Bind them there. Keep them there. Right upon your fingers. Okay? Go to Numbers. God is very particular as far as this commandment is concerned. Go in Numbers 1538. God is telling the children of Israel to divide the, their garment. And in the garment, put a blue ribbon at all the fringe of the garment so that when they are about to steal, that blue ribbon will be hanging. Remember in the commandment, thou shalt not steal. God is a very particular God. He did everything for us to save us. Numbers chapter 15 and verse 38. The word blue means to be remembered. Go ahead. Hold. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they may make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders of ribbon of blue and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye use to go whoring. You hear? God is very particular. We are, the, we are spiritual Israel. That still is applicable to us today. And we'll we don't have the fringe, but we could look up and see blue. Remember, God is still in control. Okay. I, I, I just want to solidify this into your heart. Let, let's, let's, go to, let's go to Psalms. Psalms 119, verse 10. 119, verse 15. Verses 126. 126. Read 126. Psalms 119, verse 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Yeah? yeah. You, you say Christ coming? How do you know Christ coming? Because Why? Because you see crime is escalating. Iniquity are bound. He said, it is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void my law. 
the place becomes lawless. You know, um, so when we see that, we know it is time for the Lord to come. Do you know that every time you sin, God cries? Bucket of tears fall from his eyes. Read verse 1 to 6. Rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. You didn't know that. Rivers of waters flow down the eyes of God. So every time you sin, do something wrong, God is crying. Why are you making God cry? Thy commandment is an everlasting, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Verse 172, read verse 172. Verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. You hear that? How many commandments are righteousness? All. all. You cannot break one. All thy commandments are righteousness. Let me go to the New Testament. Matthew five seventeen. He said, Think not that I have come to destroy the law. The Greek word is katalusai. Think not I have come to katalusai the law, but I come to plerosai the law, to fulfill. The word katalusai means to, to do away with, to destroy, to annihilate, to wipe out of existence. The word fulfillment means to render complete obedience to, to fully satisfy. You said, think, don't let it ever enter into your vocabulary <clears throat> that I have come to destroy the law, but I come to fulfill it. I come to make it honorable. I come to magnify it so that you can see it. When Jesus Christ came, he was a lawgiver. He came down and became the lawkeeper. He magnified. And if you read here in 18 and 19, he said, Till heaven and earth shall pass away, but were not one jot or one tittle in my law, in no wise shall pass away. In other words, what he's saying, he said, As long as you dot an I, and as long as you cross a T, my law stands forever. Are you still, are you still dotting I's and crossing T's? Not one jot or one tittle. In no way shall be the way for my law. If you break the law and teach others to do so, you shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. But if you teach others, you shall be called the great in the kingdom of God. Okay? What about John 15, 5? John, no, John 14 and verse 15. John 15 and verse 10. What John 14, 15 say? If you what? Do what? Keep my commandments. So if you are not keeping the commandments, there is no love relationship. He said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. <coughs> okay. Let me give you some more in the New Testament. Okay. James. James 2 and verse 10, what it says. For whosoever shall, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend it in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you keep nine and you violate one, you're guilty of breaking all, right? Because First John 3, 4 says that sin is a what? Transgression of the, Transgression of the law. For James 2, 12 says what? You are going to be judged by the what? No, read, read that one, James 2, 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. But I thought it was a law of bondage. <laughs> a lot of people believe that, no, if you keep the law, you are in bondage. But the Bible says it sets you free. It's a law of liberty. The law of the law is what? Perfect converting the soul. So how can you expect, experience conversion if you're not keeping the law? But let me show you something here what the Bible says here. In Romans Romans 8 and verse 7 and 8. He said, A carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. Those in the flesh cannot please God. 
In other words, if you have not experienced the new boat transaction, you cannot keep the law. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Unless you are being converted, changed into the renewing of your mind, you cannot keep the law. And as Christians, we do not keep laws to be saved. We keep laws as a result of being saved. It's a good testimony that you have been with Jesus. Okay? So, law cannot save you, but you cannot be saved without it. <laughs> okay, look at it here. Look at it here. First John 5 and verse 14. This is the confidence we have if we ask God anything according to his what? His will. His will is expressed in the precept of his holy law. Let me show you something. This might shock you. In John 3.22. Read John 3.22. And read Proverbs 28 and verse 9. Read John 3.22. Mm -hmm. It says, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into not, the land not, of Not Judah. a text. 322. Pardon? First John 322. Pardon me. Pardon, pardon me. First John 322. And whatsoever you ask, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because, because we keep his commandments yeah, yeah. and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If you are not keeping his commandments, your prayers will not be answered. Read Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9 and you will see something similar. 29. 9. his ear from hearing the law even his prayer shall be an abomination. You hear that? If you turn away from hearing the law, which is the word of God, even your prayer is an abomination. The word law is a bigger word than commandment. The word law means all the revealed word of God or his divine instruction. If you turn away your ear from hearing the law, even your prayer is an abomination. So you can be sinning even while you are praying. That might shock you. Okay, let me get one again. First John. Five, read one and two. First John five. First John five one and two. Um, Whosoever believe it that Jesus is. The Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begat love, him also. First John, First John chapter five, five, one and two. Huh? One and two. Yeah. So it says here. Let me read it over. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begat love him, loveth him also. That is begotten of him. In, verse, that is first John. First John five one. First John five one and two. Verse that, two says, it? Okay. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, verse two, really right? verse two I was driving at. Um go to first John five eighteen. We know that whosoever no, no. is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth him, and, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Can, can, we keep, can we really keep the commandments? A lot of Adventists ask the question, can we really keep the commandments? By, by, by <laughs> with, that, with that text there. And read this other text here, 1 John 3, 9. And let me give you some other text again. 1 John 3, 9. And it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for sin, 
for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Mm -hmm. wow. You hear that? Yes. You cannot sin. You don't plan to sin. You don't love sin. <laughs> okay. Read Titus 2, 11 and 12. Revelation 14 and verse 5. And um, Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and verse 27. 2, 11 and 12. It starts with the grace of God. Yeah, okay, good. So it says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation and appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly Where? in this present world. Where? In this present world. How are you living? Righteously, soberly, righteously and, and godly. godly. Where? In this present in world. In this present world. Go to Revelation 14.5. Fourteen five. For in their mouth. And in his, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before, before the throne of the grace. Throne of God. Go to Ezekiel thirty six, verse twenty six and verse twenty seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. One sec, one sec. All right, so it says this. A new, a new heart also will I give you. Mm. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And uh, verse 27. What, watch, watch, watch verse 27, eh? Yeah. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgment and do them. You hear that? What Paul said? Paul said, not I, but Christ. He said, I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and my judgment and keep them. I will do that. I will come into you. Just allow me to come in. Because if you look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, Christ was walking in the midst of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Seven golden candlesticks. By the time you reach in Revelation 3.20, he was outside of the door knocking. What he is doing outside there? Religious people put him out. We put him out. Now he's saying, if you are open the door, I will come in and I will sup with you. And I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statue and my judgment and keep it. So don't listen to people and say, well, you can't keep it. The children of Israel, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, he gave them six things to do. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to put away sin. Number one, put away sin, finish transgression, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Put away sin and finish transgression. Before the high priest were to enter into the most holy place, the children were to afflict their soul and put away sin. Before the high priest goes into the most holy place, no, before the high priest comes out of the most holy place, we are to afflict our soul and put away sin because if the high priest should come and sin is found in our life, we shall be destroyed by the very presence of his glory. Okay? We know Revelation 14, 12. Look at Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon is wrought with who? The one that went to make war with the what? Which keep the what? The commandment of God. So the, the, the remnant church keeping the commandments. That's right. Amen. They don't profess. They keep the commandments. And have the what? Faith. Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus. Look at Revelation 14, 22, 14. That's a passport for the kingdom of God. Blessed are the day that do what? His commandment that they may have right to the tree of life and enter into the city. Yep. The rights. The commandment is a passport to heaven. 
you, you, you say you can't keep it. The prophet says that Christ's obedience makes it possible for every soul to keep the commandments. You, you say, well, I can't keep it. That is the flesh we're talking there because you say the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. Those in the flesh cannot please God. So in other words, if you have never experienced a new boat transaction, a conversion, you can't keep the law. No matter how you try, you have to come to Christ. You have to be born again, transformed in the renewing of your mind. Repent and be converted in the time of refreshing and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you. No, that is a serious thing. Repent and be converted in the time of refreshing. That's the latter rain. And your sins will be blotted out. Everything provided a way mm -hmm. for salvation. Oh yeah, and made provision for forgiveness. Of yeah, sins. everything he has done, everything, so that we can be saved. We have no excuse. You could make excuse, but in God's sight, there is no excuse. Paul said, "I have not shown to give you all the counsel of God," and that's why we have it. All the counsel of God. And let me tell you something. If you don't know these texts and memorize these texts, you will be coming before the judge and lawyers to answer for your faith. And hear what the prophet says. She said, when you come before the judge and the lawyers to answer for your faith, the way how you talk, you can, you can win them across for Jesus. They will be convicted. Know these texts. This is just a few texts I put on the board, and the board is filled already. And I never sit and memorize this. The Lord puts it into your heart. Amen? Amen. So the commandment and the faith of Jesus is a third angel message. This is the message. This is the message. We live in by the faith of Jesus and the commandment. This is Adventism. If you fail to understand that, if you don't know that, you are already in trouble. You could take more, one more? Could it, one more? Okay. No, not on this. This subject is over. Where put the, okay. I will not alter the things that gone out of my mouth. Where, Psalms. God will not change it. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I am the Lord, I change not. God never changed. His character never changed. It's common sense. It's a violation of the law that have us living in sin, down into this world. It's the obedience thereof will cause us to go back up. Oh, it's, it's simple. Amen. Let me talk to you on something that it's very close to your heart. You practice it every day. But, but maybe you don't know. Let me talk to you about prayer. What is prayer? Conversation with God. Anybody, what is prayer? Hmm? Opening your heart to God. Anybody else again? Hmm? Making a request to him. Okay. Okay. Do you know that prayer is not a, not a religious activity? Prayer is not a religious activity. Prayer is a legal activity. On the cross, he gains the right to give us the authority to come boldly to the throne of grace and plead our case in a time of need. That's a legal... When I came into America here to live, when I became a citizen, I have legal rights to petition the government, I have legal rights to bear arms, I have legal rights to vote, and I have legal rights to run for office. That gives me legal rights. On the cross, Christ gained the legal rights for me to come boldly to the throne of grace. Legal rights to go. And let me tell you something. Else. God gave us the legal rights to reject him. Do you know that? He gave us a free will. He said, whosoever will, may come. So let me, let me give you a definition. Because I'm, I'm giving you some new things here. 
Prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference, intervention or interference. Prayer, prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference. God will not intervene until you ask him to intervene. You can be going through the greatest trouble in life and Jesus is just passing by. Until you call upon him, he will not intervene. You have the right to give him access to your life. And many of us have not, even though we pray, we have not given him access into our life. His earthly permission for heavenly interference. He gave man dominion upon the earth to rule. He will not interfere until man messed up. He interfered in Sodom and Gomorrah when he see man was going to destroy himself. He interfered in the antediluvian world because he see what was going to happen. But God said, you rule. You need me? Call upon me. I will help you. Okay, so prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interven intervention. So let, let me show you something. It has been said by many, there are three answers to prayer. Have you ever heard that? Yes. yes. No. no. And wait. Do you believe that? That is not biblical and is not theologically correct neither. Let me show you something. In 1 John 5, 14. Somebody read. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. Read. That two texts alone knock that off. 1 John 5, 14. I wonder if there's something. Mm -hmm. It says here, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hear it us. He hear it us, right? Yep. But watch this. Go to here. Second Corinthians one twenty. Second Corinthians one twenty. I'm looking for something here. I wonder if I have it in my food. For all the promises of God are in him. Let me read over that. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him. Amen unto the glory of God. Did you hear that? He said all the promises are yea in him and amen in him. All is yes. Hmm. All right. <laughs> All the promises. All the promises are yes. Hear what he says again here. In Romans 4.21. What he says? Romans 4.21 says, And being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was able to also to perform. There's over 5,000 promises in the Bible. God is able to perform every one of them. He promised that. He's not slack concerning his promise. As men come slackness, but long suffering towards us, not willing any should perish, but all should come to the repentance. There's a text, a quotation in Ellen G. White, which says that. I have to read that. I can't quote it for you. You have to read it for you to believe. Type in these are pages 116. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's go again. Let's see. Let's see if that is truth. Okay. Matthew. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. First John 1 9. Somebody read First John 1 9. John. Just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all on read, read, read John 14, 13, and 14. John 13, 14. Matthew 21, 22. Read. Just one sec, one sec. Mm -hmm. John 14, Yeah. Verse 13 and 14? Yeah. Okay. It says, and 
Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay. Verse 14 says, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You hear that? If you shall ask what? Anything. Anything in my name. What he will say? Hang on. Wait. I'll get tomorrow. I want to ask a question. I'll, I'll, somebody question will answer as I go along. Now seeing that God is saying that anything we ask in his name, mm. he will do it. What prevents us from asking? From <laughs> getting what we ask for. What, what is the hindrance mm. that can hinder us from accessing God's promises? Okay, I'll come to that. Eh? I'll come into that now. I'll answer your question there. Okay, keep asking the question and I'll answer it as we go along. Anybody reading? Read, read John 14, 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Okay, read Matthew 21 and verse 22. Matthew 21. Mm -hmm. Verse 22, right? Yeah. It says, oh, it's on the other side. That's a long chapter. All right. All, and all things whatsoever you shall ask uh -huh. in prayer, believe, believing you shall receive. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Believe you shall receive. Yes. Okay. Read Proverbs 15:29. Proverbs 1529. 1529. 1529. 1529. Yeah. Okay. It says, The Lord is far from the wicked. Well, listen. Go ahead. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. He heareth the prayer of the what? <laughs> Did he say, Well, I wouldn't hear you today, I'll go hear you tomorrow. <laughs> You hear the prayer of the righteous. Okay. Okay. So let me show you something here. I'll give us some text. Okay. What Psalm 68 and verse 18 say? Read. So we see here it's positive. Whatever I ask, God is going to give it unto you. If you ask according to his will, all his promises are yea and amen. Whatever you perform, he is able to promise. Whatever you promise, he is able to perform. So in other words, we, when we ask God, we ask him according to his will. He will perform it. Go to Psalm 68 and verse 18. And verse 18. Somebody else go to Psalms, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Okay. Isaiah, what are you reading? Psalm 68 and verse 18. Verse 18 says, Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. Oh no, Yay. oh no, oh no, huh? oh no. Something wrong, something, something wrong here. Go to, let, let's shift it around. Go to Psalms 59. Uh, yeah, I, I think I read uh, 66, he says. Yeah. I, if, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord, the Lord will, not, will hear not hear What text is that? That is 66, That is a Psalms? Psalms. Well, right, that's correct. Okay, if you regard iniquity in your heart, what the Lord said? Will not hear I will not hear you. What is iniquity? Iniquity is having evil thoughts. Huh? Yeah. It is deliberate sin. Planning your sin. God will not hear you. Psalms, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. What it says? Isaiah what? 59. 1 and 2. Behold the Lord's hand is not short, that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, mm -hmm. and your sins have hidden his face from you, that he will not, not hear. Yeah. Your sin. Wow. Not chopped down, just type in. Um, yeah. Somewhere, Elder, in the Bible it says that the Lord will, will not 
uh, withhold any good thing from them that walk upright. Yeah, true. But I want to, I want to show you this here. <laughs> Read James 1, 6 and 7. James 1, 6. You see? <laughs> Receive anything of the Lord because you're asking, but you're wavering. You go to the doctor, the doctor say you have cancer, but you're going to pray. The elders come in, but we pray, eh? But we have in the back of our head, cancer cannot be healed. You're wavering. You're doubting God. You see? So when you go, go with positive attribute that God is going to heal, God is going to intervene. Read um, James 3 4. Should we read in James 3 4? James 3 4? Check. Okay, let me just find that here. James 3 4, yes, it says, Behold, also the ship, which do they be no, so good. No, not, not, not X. Is the wrong text? Oh, yes, 4 3. Yeah, 4, that's it. 4 3. 4 3? Yeah. Okay, so it says, 4 3 says, Ask and receive. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So you're asking according to your lust, yeah. not for your benefit or the benefit of humanity. <coughs> so the Lord said he will not give it unto you. Okay, all right. Go to Proverbs 21 and verse 13. Proverbs 21 and verse 13. Let me show you something. This one will shock you. This one going to shock you. Did you hear that? <laughs> he that stoppeth his ear from the cry of the poor. When you cry, the Lord will not hear you. Mm. When there was need in the church, when there was need in the neighborhood, there was need in the family, and you can supply it, and you fail to supply it, when you go to God for your need, he will not fulfill your need. Mm. That's how serious it is. Yeah. Others in the church, those who we work with, mm. are needy, and quit praying for ourselves. Yeah. Because God can take care of it. Right? That is so true. He, your prayer. So, what's this now? All this is equal to James 4 2. What does James 4 2 say? Huh? What does James 4 2 say? Somebody read. Okay, I'm going to read it now. James 4 2 says. Where, where my phone? Give me my phone. Yes. Yeah, what it says? You see that? But you, we, we're saying that if we ask, God say no. God say you have not because you never ask. You never ask. And let me show you something. This is what I'm looking for in these of ages, page two something. In these of ages two seventeen, let me see. Oh, I got it. I got it. The Lord brought it before me here. Here were the prophecies. Ever since Adam's sin, the human race had been cut off from direct communication with God. The intercourse between heaven and earth has been true Christ. But now that Jesus Christ had, had come in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Father himself spoke. He had before communicated with humanity through Christ. Now he communicated with humanity in Christ. So if you think that you can go to God and mumble jumble, whatever you want to say, in the name of Jesus, that means nothing. Attaching the name of Jesus to the end of your prayer does not mean nothing because God does not communicate to us anymore through Christ. He communicates to us now in Christ. In Christ is justification. That is exactly what these two texts say. If iniquity is in the heart, he will not hear you. 
But if Christ is in her heart, he's going to hear you. So be careful. You, you get on your knees and you mumble jumble something and you say, in the name of Jesus, and you feel Christ, that is heard and know. When you go to God, you have to go to God in Christ. And that's what this one's saying. All the promises in him, in him is yea, in him is yea. In him is justification. I in Christ and Christ in me. I in Christ is justification. Christ in me is sanctification. So if your life is not right, forget it. You can say whatever you want and put at the end. In Jesus' name does not mean a thing. So let me see how Christ pray. In the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Matthew 4. That was a temptation. <coughs> In verse 4, and verse 4, that's a promise. Some of them have a little cough to bother with that. Yeah, read. Verse 4, and verse 5 and 6 is the temptation. Mm -hmm. Verse 4 and verse chapter 4 and verse 7 is the promise. Chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9 is the temptation. 4 and verse 10 is the promise. Mm -hmm. That's how Jesus Christ prayed. Read. Then verse 10. No, read, read, read them. Um, verse 1 to 3 and then go to verse 4. Three and four. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when the tempter came to him, uh -huh. he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Mm -hmm. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by uh -huh. every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Verse five. Then the devil take him up into uh -huh. the high city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, uh -huh. cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angel charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot. No, no, no. I, I wanted stone. to stop at verse 3. Verse 3? Yes. Okay, verse that three. was the temptation. Verse 3. When to turn the stone into a bread. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So in other words, Jesus is showing us how to pray. He said, prayer is claiming Bible promises. Right. Where did he got that from? He got that from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Read Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. He was quoting scripture. He was claiming the promise. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. So I'm showing you how Jesus prayed. Because this, these are the temptation here, and this is how we promise, how we claim the promise. Okay? Deuteron verse, uh, Deuteronomy 8 and 3? Yeah. 8 verse 3 says, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, And he humbled, and he humbled thee, and suffered thee to, hung, to hunger, and feed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy father know, that he might make thee, Know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out But that of is what Jesus was quoting. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of, that proceeds out of the word of God. And all the temptation in Deuteronomy 6.16, Deuteronomy 6.13, he was claiming the promise. That's where it comes from in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So when the devil tempting here, he said, devil, man shall not be live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Devil, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God in faith. This is where he got it from. In the Old Testament, he was quoting scripture. So prayer is, let me show you something. In this room, it has internet wave. It has TV wave. But I'm not seeing any picture. I'm not hearing any music. Because we haven't got, I haven't got the conduit to draw it down. Prayer is what draws down from heaven 
what he has in store for us. Let me show you what he has in store for us. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. And before that, go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. And before that, go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. I could go whole day with this. I just showed you some main point. I could stay whole evening with the same thing and pray to show you something. But I want to show you something here. Go to Ephesians 1 and verse 20 first. And I'm going to show you where we are. Which he wrought in Christ uh -huh. when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So where where was Jesus? He's what? at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Yes. Heavenly places. Go to Ephesians two and verse six. Verse two six says, And had raised us raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. So when you in when you Christ accept Jesus, Jesus Christ as your Amen. personal savior, where are you sitting? You're sitting in heavenly places already in Christ Jesus. And, and what happened there? Go to verse 3, first chapter 1 and verse 3. What he gave us there? Chapter 1 verse 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, bless. who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where the blessing is? In Christ Jesus. Where? In, heaven. in heavenly places. Pray, draw it down. Mm -hmm. God has your name on a package in heaven with everything for you that pertain to life and godliness and you are living in poverty on this earth. Mm. Spiritual poverty. All your blessing is in heavenly places. Prayer draws it down. Mm. We haven't got it because we're not praying. We say in a prayer, some of us have some prayer we struck here, and we just recite it. God doesn't listen to that. Prayer is a cry out of your soul. And say, Lord, come in, take charge. Let me show you one thing before I close. How David pray. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel? Yeah. Oh, read from verse 1. Read the story. Chapter, chapter 7, Second Samuel chapter 7, did I say chapter 7? Yes, go to 7. Second Samuel 7, 1 is it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read. And it says, And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from above, from all his enemies, yes, that the king so. said unto Nathan, Okay. Yeah, go ahead. See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God... No, 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 no. listen to the story carefully now. He's but, telling him he's mm -hmm. dwelling in a house of cedar, mm -hmm. right? Go ahead, read. Right. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night, Mm -hmm. that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, no. Shall thou build me a house for me? Yeah, so now you hear, the, you hear the thing. The word of the Lord came to, um, to, to Nathan, and Nathan is coming to tell David mm -hmm. that he, all right, you have a desire to build a house. You live in, uh, we live in Sidon, and, and the, the, the house of God is in tent. And, 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 he, and, and he talk about that. But go, and, uh, what I want to see, I wanted to see how David prayed. Go down to verse 25. Verse 25. Listen to how David prayed. Listen how we should pray. It sounds like a command. Hear David praying. For thou hast confirmed to thyself, thy people Israel, to be a people unto oh, thee oh, no, forever. No, 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 hold on, hold on a minute. What, what verse are you reading here? Verse 24. No, 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 verse 25. And now, O oh Lord, you hear? No, no. Listen, David is praying now. And Nathan, now, Nathan sorry. already told David what God said, mm -hmm. and David is now going before God. Hear how David pray. Read. And now, O oh Lord God, the the word that Thou hast spoken concerning Thy servant and concerning his house, 
establish it forever, and do as thou hast said, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, okay, The Lord okay. of hosts is the God of Israel over uh, okay, Israel. Uh, the, the point is saying, and let the house of thy servant David be established. So David, David is therefore. saying, based on what Nathan has told him, that God agree and God said a bit out. David went to God and said, Lord, you said it, let it be done now. In other words, you know what is prayer? Prayer is taking God's word and throwing it back into his face. Lord, you said that, let it be done now. Prayer is claiming Bible promise. Whatever he perform, promise he will be able to perform. If your prayer doesn't have a Bible promise, it will not be answered. It must be attached to a Bible promise. All the prayer must be attached to a Bible promise. In other words, the Lord, you said that. Let it be done now. That's right. That's right. That's, 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 First John 5, 14 say, this is a confidence we have. If we ask God anything according to his will, he's going to give it unto us. But you see, we have in our heart, Lord, you say no. Oh, Lord, you say wait. I have been waiting for 40 years. Nothing can happen. I'm waiting for this wife for 40 years and she has not come yet. Oh, no, you will keep waiting because God never say that. God say all my promises is yes and amen. So when you start to believe the word of God, then it's going to happen to you. Amen and yes, 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 yes. All is yes, 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 yes. But let me show you something. If you go to Daniel chapter 10, you're going to see Daniel prayed. 10, was 10, 11, and 12. Daniel prayed to understand the prophecy. I think it's a 2300 prophetic, prophetic um, event. And, and could you understand? And then God sent Gabriel to give him understanding. And Gabriel was withheld by the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia for 21 days. And then God tell Daniel, from the day you asked of me, from the day you inquire, your prayer was answered. I was sent. But the, 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 the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which I believe was the devil himself, because who can hold back Gabriel? Who can hold back Gabriel? And then the Bible says, Michael the prince came and delivered a message. Who is Michael? Jesus. Michael is Jesus. So sometimes you pray in your house and maybe at the, the, the things not right and maybe the evil spirit maybe i don't want to say, say something that you know that you take it as doctrine but what i'm saying something might not be right in the home that hinder in your prayer but from the moment you pray god say yes god answer the prayer but something is standing in the way for you to receive the prayer receive the, the result but give God permission, he will not intervene until you ask him to. He will not. Revelation 3.20, I stand on the door, and what are you doing? Knock. Knocking. He has the power to kick down the door, but he will not kick it down. He wants you to open it up. So that's, you have the right to tell him when to come in. Open up, and he will come in. If you never open up, you will never come in. You might be going through the greatest trouble in your life, and Jesus is just passing by. He will not come in until you open up that door and let him in. Okay, question now. I will stop there. There's many I could teach you on this, but you got the point. All is yes and amen. It's earthly permission for heavenly interference. Heaven will not interfere until you invite him to. Any question? Or you forever hold your peace? Yeah, question.
Well, well, you can you can spiritualize it, but it's a physical application because they would say we are dealing in in house of cedar, and the church is intent. Yeah, yeah, right. You say they say build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among us. You, you see, let, let me let me let me let me let me push this a little further um, to bring that understanding. God, church is a movement. When God say move, move. When the cloud move, move. But we become so institutionalized. Right? We become so institutionalized as a church with a temple mentality trying to serve a sanctuary God. Go ahead. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says he will tabernacle with us where two or three are gathered. I got the it. Old mm -hmm. Testament mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, mm -hmm. Christ in our midst. Yeah. So which oh, I, 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 I got you. you, you I, I got you, I got you, I got you. I, 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 I got you. I see where you're driving at, yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. one is we go to his dwelling place to yeah. meet with him. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, when we talk, when we talk, talk synagogue or church, uh -huh. where two or three are gathered, it's where we two or three people meet. <laughs> yeah, you go, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm asking you. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. So this time, which one is more up together? Mm -hmm. Where two or three are gathered, right? Obviously. The word church comes from a Greek word, ecclesia. It really derived from a Greek word. Ek is out, and ekalio. Um, ekalio is to call. So God's church is really a call out people, out of darkness into the marvelous light. When he said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said to Peter, upon this rock, he's talking about him, I will build my church, my church. He has a church, singular, possessive pronoun, my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Ellen G. White said, the church is not a great cathedral or the national establishment or the various denomination. She said the church is those who love the Lord and keep his commandments. Acts of the Apostles, page 11, say, faithful souls constitute the church. Amen. So where two and three are gathered, in his name, that's his church. His yeah, his presence is there. Amen. Because the church is mobile or mobile, depends on how you pronounce it, English or American. It's mobile. It's, it's, it's a movement. It doesn't stay one place. It's not an institution. That was man's idea. But God's church is a movement. When God move, they move. When the, when the cloud move, the chain of Israel move. So what God does not want us to be an institution or organization become static and, and remain dead, but it's a movement. Uh-huh. Emotional 
part, emotion goes with it. Well, love, love is emotion. Love is a high and holy principle circumscribed by emotion. Right, but yeah. law and commandment that mm. you are talking about. And we seem to understand it interchangeably at times. Mm. Right? Law and commandment being the same thing. Mm -hmm. And how we, how emotional God is, mm -hmm. remember, right? Yeah. When we sin, he cries. Oh, isn't mm -hmm. that so? Okay. So if we were to see law as a transcript of something written as, as we read it, then a transcript can never be emotional. And with the study that we did earlier there, aren't we then to understand that Jesus Christ is the law and the Ten Commandments in flesh? Are we to understand that? Well, it's embodied in him because the law is a transcript of his divine perfection. No, that, that's, that's it in a code. Transcript, uh, tra uh, transcript of a holy and divine character. So you see, you see, we can separate, in other words, we cannot separate Jesus from his character. The law is his character. Transcript of his character? Y yeah, a transcript of his divine and holy character. The written law? Yeah. But isn't he himself then? Mm. Aren't we to think that he himself is the Ten Commandments or the law in flesh? Well, the word was made flesh and dwell among us. So, so well, well, you see, you see, if you accept Jesus Christ as the person, and you see, that's the same mistake the Jews made because the Jews tried to separate it. Modern Christendom trying to separate it, but you can't separate it. Right. You can't separate it. So he, we, we are to take it that be, be, Because man. when I talk about he is the very embodiment of truth. He is the very embodiment of truth. The word was made flesh and dwell among us, and the law is his character. So when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about the truth, we're talking about character embodied in him. So he is the truth in flesh. In flesh. And therefore, he's the law in flesh, he's the in flesh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any, any other question? I think also with the law written in stone, it's important that the law was written personally by God's finger mm -hmm. for a visual for God's people mm -hmm. because they needed something that they could see mm -hmm. and read and remember the fourth commandment yeah. is mentioned the word remember all the other commandments are starting with another word but remember mm -hmm. the Sabbath day remember me yeah. the Lord thy God who led you out of Egypt so they could keep that law with them mm -hmm. before them to teach their children's children etc yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you're quite right any other question yeah yeah thanks for your question to bring edification anybody else have any question is, is every all right so just remember you can pray in the name of Jesus and it doesn't mean anything. Because God now answers your prayer in, in Christ. We've got to be in Christ. Not just through Christ, but now in Christ. Amen? So let me put that text, huh? Let me put that on the board. That's Acts, these are of ages, page 116. Sometime 117. Read that. It's important for you to read that. <coughs> yeah, question. Is it possible? Mm hmm. <clears throat> well, that question is so kind of a difficult to answer because um, to be in Christ now, in a few minutes, you're out of Christ. Yeah, it can happen because the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times. S seven times you could be in a position of righteous now and you walked out and you fall. The righteous man falls seven times. So you... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I'm looking at... It says every man sin when he's drawn away. By his own lost and By enticed. His own lost. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, as far as I see, if a person have a relationship with, as you say, in marriage, mm -hmm. you love your wife. When you love a woman, you don't see no other woman, you know. Yeah. That's the truth. 
It's true. Mm-hmm. And if no, that in the, in the physical uh, um, aspect is very strong. But I want to suggest in the spiritual relationship, mm-hmm. Christ is even stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, but bear in mind. Mm. You quoted a text mm. that says, "He that is born of God cannot sin. Cannot sin, mm-hmm. for his seed remains mm-hmm. in him." Who is the seed? The seed is Christ. <laughs> Say, if Christ is in you. The Bible says, if, how we put it in Romans, it says, if we walk after the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the Ro- lust of oh, yeah, the yeah. Romans. So in my mind, mm. a person who has a real good relationship with Jesus. I got, I got, I, I got what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. It seems impossible to me. Mm-hmm. Because he has to bombard, the Holy Spirit is bombarding him all the time. The moment temptation comes, the Holy Spirit is bombarding you. I, I got you, I got you. I got you. So to say that I have a, ch- a life in the church, I live in life, and I go out the world and I live in a country life. Or I have my wife, I'm a Christian, and I'm seeing a young lady, and my eyes on she, I'm not in Christ. Do you know it? Do you know it is possible to have an outward correctness of behavior without experiencing the new yeah. boot transaction? Yeah. You look like a Christian. You go to church like a Christian. You sin like a Christian. You give like a Christian, but you are not. Right. Watch. Watch that. Okay. If no question again, we'll have to wrap up. Amen. We we had a wonderful time. Have you <clears throat> have you learned anything this this afternoon? Amen. That's yes. Huh? What is it? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Have you been blessed? So what have we learned this evening? It's a rhetoric question, right? You said what? A lot. <laughs> All right. What, I take, what I'm taking away from this whole study is that if we are born again, if Christ is living in us, we can live a life that is pleasing to God. Not only that, but we can have all our promises. We can, as a matter of fact, have all our, prom- all our prayers answered. We have access to the throne of grace that we, as God's people, can experience the riches of Christ's glory presently. So when we call, he will answer. When a situation comes before it, before it, whether it be sickness, whether it be situation, whether it be family problems, whatever it might be, God has all the answers. And we can access the love, the mercy, and the favor of Christ at any moment, any time, if we will walk uprightly. As the text says, he will not withhold anything from us if we walk uprightly in his sight. By God's grace, let us focus in our hearts to live a life that will glorify Christ so that we all can make it into his kingdom when he comes. What do you say? Amen. 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 All right. Uh, Let us all rise as we pray. Gracious Father, we want to thank you for your man servant this evening. We thank you for the things that we have learned. We thank you for the the interpretations and the lessons that you have given us through your man servant. And help us, Lord. Grant us receptive hearts that as we go home to our homes that these things will move around in our minds. That we'll think about them. That we'll make them a part of our lives. And we'll learn to love you and obey you with all our hearts, soul, and mind that it may be well with our souls. Draw us into a closer walk with you, Lord, and anoint us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Be with your man servant, we pray, that you would continue to bless him, you continue to strengthen him, and use him to your praise, name, honor, and glory. So we give you thanks, and what we fail to ask you today, please grant us 
This week that is ahead of us, we dedicate and commit our lives to you. Have your way in our lives. Is our prayer with thanksgiving. And bless every family that is represented here. Is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' holy name we pray.